Hey everybody, Steve here in the Illinois Recording Studio. I have the great pleasure of yet again being able to show you one of the rarest drums in the entire world, a Billy Gladstone original snare drum. And this is a very, very unique piece and I have a great privilege of being able to offer this kit for sale, kit snare drum for sale again. It's an absolutely beautiful specimen and it is a, there's a backstory to this. This is a drum, you'll see all this detail by the way on uh, my website, maxwelldrums.com, there's a link on the main page, kick you over to all the information and photos. This drum, uh, Billy made about 50 or so drums in his entire lifetime that he personally made in his New York studio. This particular drum is one that he made prior to the first two drums he made, one of which was for Buster Bailey and one of which was for Shelly Mann. Now, this drum, Chet Falzerano uh, is, I should backstory this a little bit, Chet Falzerano is a very good friend of mine. Chet and Arnie Lang were the two most uh, incredible experts on Billy Gladstone ever. Uh, Arnie passed away a few years ago. Uh, Chet is still with us, thankfully. And uh, I have learned everything I know about Gladstone from those two guys uh, over the course of the years. Now, Billy made drums that incorporated a three-way tuning system and a very unique snare strainer and a very unique muffler. And I'll give you a little backstory on that in a minute. But first and foremost, this drum is one that Billy made, as I said, as a prototype before he built his traditional drums. Now, a little bit further back, before the war, there was a series of Gladstone drums that were called Gretsch Gladstone. And those drums incorporated Billy's strainer, Billy's three-way tuning design to a degree, and in some cases a two-way design. And those were built by the Gretsch company, and so they would have had the Gretsch badge on the drums, Another differentiating feature was the lug that was used here, the tension lug, on a Gretsch Gladstone was a single node lug, not the double post like this one. So there's a difference there. Uh, now, the, the fact that Billy made these drums in his apartment is very cool to begin with, but also Billy had a tendency to like to use the Gretsch shell that was a three-ply thin shell. This particular drum is unusual in a number of ways, and we think this is why it kind of lends itself to being a prototype. When Billy began thinking about starting to make his own Gladstone drums out of his apartment, this was a drum that we believe was done as a prototype to play around with some different ideas. First of all, this shell has a reinforcement ring in it. A reinforcement ring is not usually seen in Gretsch shells and it was not usually preferred by Billy. It wasn't preferred by Billy. He didn't use it in his production drums. But on this particular shell, it has a reinforcement ring. Billy felt that without a reinforcement ring, the sound traveled more cleanly and purely. So that's one difference. Another difference here, of course, from the Gretsch Gladstone drums, is that the tension casings, as we call them the lugs, on this drum are the two-post version, two posts as opposed to one, and there's photos on the website that show this. Another difference is this drum is wrapped in a pearl finish. Now, Billy's general tendency was to not wrap drums with a pearl finish. He felt that that was something that somewhat inhibited the sound of the drum. So when you look at this, it's kind of an interesting example. It looks like it was a test case for many different things. A test case for trying a drum with a, a shell with reinforcement rings, trying a drum with a wrap on it, to kind of maybe carry forward and say, okay, yeah, I'm going to change this design a little bit over for my own production drums, which he, of course, did. So I consider this drum to be what I call the alpha. And many, many years ago, I had this drum in my own possession, and I also had the last drum that Billy ever built, which was a bird's eye maple with gold hardware. And I used to call that pair the Alpha Omega pair. And I vowed never to sell them individually, only as a pair to a person who would be able to appreciate them. I did do that at one point in the past, and that person, um, unfortunately, at one point had to uh, sell the uh, Omega, but has just recently sent this back to me to broker on his behalf. So this is an extremely, extremely rare piece. Crazy rare. Now, a couple of things with this. You'll see on my website, there is a uh, picture of the, there's a before and after picture. The before picture shows the drum the way it came to me. And this had come from a collection of, of a different person. The drum came to me and these rims, they were the original, uh, they were kind of a cheaper metal that were used on these drums back in this day. So when they were plated with gold, over the course of time, the gold would all chip off and flake off. So the original rims on this had been flaked off down to basically just the bare metal. I sent this drum out to my friend Arnie Lang for uh, two reasons. One, he replaced the rims with uh, gold plated to match the rest of the kit, uh, die cast rims, and 
right here. In this area behind this plate, and I'll tell you about this plate a little more in a minute, behind this plate there was a group of holes. And when I looked at those holes, to me they sort of reminded me of holes that you would have used as, uh, on a drum with a heater. Because back in the day when these drums were made, we're talking about the 40s here, there were no plastic heads, you had all calf. So you had to have basically a hole in the drum with a light bulb and a plug into the wall to keep the calf heads in tension. So, when we looked at this, I looked and looked and looked and I couldn't understand the hole pattern. Arnie Lang looked at it and he said, I know that hole pattern. It's a hole pattern that we used to use on timpani to install heaters on timpani to keep them in tune. So, okay, that's cool. So when I sent this drum to Arnie, before it went to its current owner that I'm brokering it for, Arnie did the work on changing the rims here for us. He also, uh, expertly behind the, uh, the badge here, plugged those little heater holes and he created this beautiful badge to commemorate the drum. Now, there's one thing that Arnie did incorrect when he commemorated this badge. He said, original Gretsch Gladstone, okay? And then it talks about restored for Steve Maxwell, original owner's name. The only issue with that is Arnie engraved the badge wrong. It says original Gretsch Gladstone, and it's supposed to say original Billy Gladstone. Now, uh, as much as I loved Arnie to bits, and Arnie passed a couple years ago, uh, Arnie was uh, not the quickest at getting other stuff done. So I asked Arnie to make a new badge, a uh, new plate, and that never happened before he passed away. So when this drum came back to me to broker again, I thought, well, should I get a replacement badge that reads correctly, or should I just leave it alone? And I asked Chet Falzerano, I, I said, Chet, I want to broker this again. You know, I think I should just leave it alone because it just makes it a little more cool part of the story. And he said, yeah, he said, just leave it as is. So anyway, long story short, uh, I think the drum's amazing, and the incredible thing about this, I know Billy decided not to use reinforcement rings, and he decided not to wrap the drums. However, he did wrap a few drums, and I've been privileged to be able to have said I've sold uh, probably now about 14 of the maybe 25 Gladstone drums that are known to exist, and the only two complete original drum kits out of the four that were made. One was destroyed, one had the bass drum destroyed in a fire, in a flood. But um, the other two sets I was uh, privileged to be able to be broker of. I, I was so privileged to have this drum in my possession to be able to broker it again. Uh, it, it's phenomenal. And when we, when we talked about wanting to do this, we said despite the fact that Billy didn't like those reinforcement rings and that he didn't like the wrap, even though he did do it periodically for a few people, Cozy Cole's drum, Saul Leslie Bimel's kit, the reality of it is this drum sounds incredible anyway. So um, you got to give a lot of credit to Billy's three way, his simple strainer. You turn it off, you turn it on, you adjust it here, right? There's a, an internal muffling system, which has a little dial over here. And there's a little metal plate, and this is all in pictures on the website. Uh, and you can dial this up, and it brings two pads up against the head, so you can take a little bit more of the overtones out. Beautiful. And then the interesting, cool part about this, especially cool, Billy was in Radio City Music Hall. There were two or three sub-basements he had to come up. From the time he got up to the stage level where the air was cooler, the, the, the heads were all out of whack because they were calf heads. So there's a lot of humidity down in the basement. You get up to stage level. You got to be futzing around with the drum, turn it upside down, doom, boom, boom, tune it. He said, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't look professional. So he invented, off the kind of the principles of a skate, uh, roller skate, a design that basically allows you to tune the entire drum from the top. So you got this kit, this key. It's got little three things on the key here, okay? One of these locks onto this little square. And when you lock on that square and you tighten it, it tunes the bottom head, not the top head, the bottom head. Now you got another little key here that's got like a hex pattern. That locks onto this little piece right here. That tunes the top head. Then once you get the top and bottom the way you want them, there's another key, the third part, locks onto the top and the bottom together so you could then change the pitch without changing the differences between the top and bottom head. It's truly ingenious. And you think about something like that, if you're in a recording studio, man, is that gonna save you time or, or not? So, another factor too, and this you'll see, a differentiator between the drums that Gretsch made and Billy's drums. On Billy's drum key, there is, it's engraved with his name, and also on the plate that sits behind the key, which is also engraved with his name and the patent numbers for uh, his design. 
So that, uh, again, those features are not going to be seen on the drums that Gretsch made. So, end of the day, there's, there's so many features here. There's even a feature, you can't stop talking about this. There's even a feature here. If you had used gut snares, which are a totally different animal, but they come through and each individual strand goes through here and there's a little tightener. Well, in here, the guy was a genius. There's a little, yeah, there's your little screw to do the individual tightening on each one of those. It's incredible. And this, it's like, what's that thing with the holes in it? That was something you could turn and close up a little bit. It was like a little extra air vent. You could let a little more air in, you know, if you wanted to, if you felt like that was something you needed, you could do that. So, now at the end of the day, push comes to shove, what does a drum sound like? You heard a little bit at the beginning. I'll give you some just quick examples of how it sounds and play around with it a little differently on some tuning things here, just with the tensioning of the wires. So, at the edges. Center. Now, we'll tune the wires up a little bit. Tighten them up on the bottom. Now, it's a little bit more. Now, take them down a little bit. And now I'm going to use that internal muffler to dry it up. So, wide open. Let's take that muffler up. Pick up a little more. And take the wires and dry them up just a little bit. So, and then more wide open. Hugely fat sound. Six by 14, six inches by 14. Billy's drums were generally either seven by 14 or six by 14. Most of them were seven by 14, and the majority of the ones he built were, as I said, seven by 14. They were black lacquer, and they had chrome hardware. Uh, no gold. Also, the inside, he always did the inside. He treated them with uh, like a black paint. This is also coated with that same black paint. So, end of the day, what we've got is an incredibly rare Gladstone snare drum that I'm really pleased to be brokering again. Uh, anyone looking for information on this, contact me direct uh, at vintagedrums at AOL.com and uh, we can talk about it. And as again, you'll see it on my website at maxwelldrums.com. On the main page, there's a link to this. There's a bunch of pictures and the whole backstory is up there for you to read.